Well, good Tuesday morning, late Tuesday morning, right before lunch, but I've already eaten. Anyway, uh, I just got my second COVID Moderna vaccine today. And I was thinking, well, if I slump over, call 911. But then I realized that if I slump over, you'll not see the video. Anyway, so far so good. Better make it now because it did kind of make me feel bad on the first shot later on. Okay, we're going to talk today <clears throat> about subjects uh, in chapter three. This is a this is an important chapter. By the way, I have given you another assignment, a few more problems to work in chapter two, and I sent that out in an email and also uh, posted that uh, as a document, as a file on Moodle. So if you can't find the email, you can always go to Moodle and, and pick it up there. We're going to talk about components other than voltage sources, current sources, and uh, resistors. We're going to talk about capacitors, and we're going to talk about inductors. So this is going to be our lecture today, and there's a lot to be said about those. You know, there's a lot of things we'd like to do in electronics, but we can't always find the perfect component. For example, there is no perfect component that you put in a circuit and it just makes a constant voltage source into a constant current source. It, it just doesn't exist. There are constant voltage diodes, don't get me wrong, but they're not perfect. They have to have a certain minimum amount of current and things like that to operate. But there are a lot of things that we would like to have and we simply don't have them. One of the things that uh, is really difficult to find is a variable gain, in other words, gain meaning variable amplification um, device where we can just put a voltage in there and easily obtain a various amount of amplification of a signal. We can do that, but it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. There's other things that would be nice and handy, but we are restricted to a certain number of very primary electrical type components. And we can do almost anything there is to do one way or the other with these components, but it's not always really, really direct. <clears throat> now, the first one we're going to look at is a capacitor. Um, I'm going to, a little bit later on in the lecture, I'm going to pause it and get you a capacitor to look at. I don't have very many, and the ones that I do have are very, very small, generally. But capacitors can be very large. If I were teaching at LSU Shreveport, I would bring out Big Blue. Big Blue is a capacitor about that big around and about that tall and has 10,000 microfarads of capacitance at 250 volts working. That device, let me put it this way, it stores enough energy, it will cause you to have an epiphany when you short the, the terminals out. I remember doing that one time back in the 90s. I charged it up really big and uh, I told the class, I said, now I'm going to get somebody to turn off the lights and I'm going to take the two contacts, the negative and positive, and I had something like a screwdriver or a nail. I said, now I'm going to close this contact. And when I do, I want you to watch it very carefully to see if there's a spark from this capacitor. It was like an explosion when I made that crossover. I mean, sparks flew all over the front of the class. And I'll never forget this girl who was watching this very intently on about the second row, literally jumped over the back of her chair and landed on a guy. He sent me a thank you card later. Anyway, landed on this guy behind her, scared the absolute... <laughs> They, you know, it's one of those little perks that you get along you know, teaching. Anyway, um, <clears throat> we'll talk about capacitors and shorting them out and storage of energy in them, but it's an energy storage device. And it works on the principle of the electric field. There's sort of a reciprocity here again between voltage and current. We have an inductor that also stores electrical energy, but it stores it in the form of a current rather than a charge. And uh, that one is also a very primary uh, device in the field of electricity and electronics. 
So let's uh, let's go over here and let me do a screen share. We'll talk about uh, the capacitor. I've got a little. I've done some drawing, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the major points here. <clears throat> it saves me a little bit of time in drawing this out. But I'm then going to, uh, when I need to, I've got another notepad under here and I can do some more sketches and, and sort of take sidebars and do some explanations where necessary. Okay, to start with, um, I'm assuming that y'all have some primary knowledge of physics. Uh, you surely had a course, all of y'all, somewhere down the line in physics. But there is something called the electric field. And the electric field is sort of unique because it has different methods of expression. In other words, different units, if you will. You can express an electric field as force per amount of charge. This is very, very standard. In other words, how many Newtons of force do I get on a charge Q if I put that charge Q in the electric field? You can also express it as volts per meter. And if it's 10 newtons per coulomb, it's 10 volts per meter over here. It's the same principal number, it's just different units, but you can express it either way. <clears throat> now, if you have two metal plates, you've got a plate here and a plate here, these plates are parallel and the distance between the plates, let's just uh, define that, we'll say that that's D. We use a lowercase d is the distance between the two plates. Now, the way this works is you got a battery here. If you attach the battery or any source, basically, what's going to happen is electrons, remember conventional versus electron flow, the electrons will flow out of the negative end of the battery and they'll come around the circuit and they will fill this plate here, not inside the middle of the plate. They actually exist on the surface of the plate. <clears throat> so the charge will actually migrate to the surface. There's no real uh, electric field inside the metal of the plate. This is some of the things that you learn from e &M, study of E&M. But you get a, a surplus of electrons over here. Well, if you get more electrons on this plate than you have protons, guess what? You've got electric field. Because if the plate is neutral, in other words, an uncharged plate, then you've got the same number of electrons as you've got protons. So for every positive charge of a proton, you got the exact same charge in the electron covering it. Copper has 29 protons, got 29 electrons. Now, if you gave it an extra electron, it would have a negative charge of one you know, unit, one electron unit. <clears throat> now, in this system, what happens is we got a negative over here, but this side over here literally sucks charge away and it moves it for a while, not continuously. This does not move charge continuously, but it draws some charge away from this plate. How much does it draw away? Well, um, it draws away the same amount of charge that was distributed over here. So what we have done basically is relocate charge. We've put more charge here, and the amount of charge we put here, <clears throat> we essentially, that much was pulled away from this other plate. Now, there is an electric field between the two because you got an uncovered proton over here and for every one of those, you got an uncovered um, or extra covered uh, electron over here. Now, if I were to put a charge here, let's say that is little q positive, okay? <clears throat> and I put it in between the plates. That little q, will generate a force. Now, because that is a positive charge, my resolution is not real good here, at least my drawing, but that is a positive charge. So it's gonna be repelled from the positive plate and drawn over here to this plate that has the extra electrons. So how much force will be involved in that? There will be a force because you've got it in electric field. There'll be a force in Newtons. Even a singular proton will have some fraction of a Newton. This will be the charge in Coulombs. So this is gonna be Newtons per Coulomb. And the little charge here would be the amount of charge you have here. And that would be the force that you would get on that. And that would be your electric field. Now, <clears throat> let's say that the distance between these two plates is a centimeter, one one hundredth of a meter. And say we put 10 volts across here. So from here to here, if I put a voltmeter across this circuit, 
which means essentially that you've got a 10 volt battery, I would measure a potential difference of 10 volts. So when you look over here, you've got 10 divided by 0 0.01, 100 centimeters in a meter. So I got 0 0.01 meters and I got 10 volts. So that would be a thousand volts per meter. That would be the electric field. And would also tell me that whatever Q is, I'm gonna have this many Newtons per that many Coulombs and it'll be the same value as the volts per meter. <clears throat> now, inside the capacitor, you have to realize that this charge is well distributed. And these electric field lines are not like where you had a singular charge and they just radiate out in all directions. In this case, the lines are parallel in here. And only at the ends do they begin to bow out. Actually, there's one here, you can draw it out here and it bows way big, comes back around. And the same thing over here. We always draw these lines from positive to negative, even though the electron is uh, what's causing the uh, negative charge. Okay, so this is our capacitor. And we have stored a charge Q on the plates of the capacitor. And when we say the capacitor is charged to a charge of Q, now that might be in nanocoulombs, it might be in microcoulomb, picocoulombs, you know, it can be any number of things. It's not typically going to be in coulombs uh, because a coulomb is a very, very large amount of charge. Okay, so we've got this, this formula here and I'm just going to give it to you. It says that Q, which is the charge on the capacitor. And by the way, if it's, let's say, a nano coulomb, this left-hand side here has a deficiency of one nano coulomb of electrons, and this has a surplus of one nano coulomb. So we don't count one and one and say, well, the charge on the capacitor is two. We look at the displacement, which would be the same charge on both plates, but we would count that as just one nano coulomb. So right here, we would have a one nano coulomb. Now, this would be the voltage that's applied to the capacitor, in this case, 10. <clears throat> and C would be a unit of capacitance. Now, the unit of capacitance is named after Michael Faraday, and it's called the Farad, F-A-R-A-D. So C is capacitance, and it's in units of farads. Q, we're familiar with that. It's in coulombs, and we know what voltage is. It's V. Now, suppose <clears throat> that I double, you know, C is not going to change typically with most capacitors. So what if I double the voltage? What if I put twice as many volts? I went from 10 to 20. Well, if C doesn't change with charge, then I've got 20 times one, uh, let's say, nanocoulomb. So I went from 10 nanocoulombs of charge to 20 nanocoulombs of charge. Everybody see that? by doubling the voltage. Now, if I make this source variable, I'm gonna put an arrow through it to symbolize that this is something like a power supply and we can increase it or decrease it in voltage or potential. So as we went from 10 volts to 20 volts, the charge increased. Now, how do you get the charge in this capacitor, the plates of the capacitor? How do you get it to increase if you don't flow a current? So as you're going up, you're going to be flowing a current. I'm going to use a script I rather than the big I because this can denote both an alternating current and a changing current. Usually when we use uppercase I, that <clears throat> that's basically indicating that we have a constant current. So anyway, here's the deal. As you change the voltage, every time you get a dV over here, okay, Every time you get a change in incremental change in voltage, a dV, you get a dQ. Well, dQ over time is a current. So we have this equation right here. The current, and I could put, you know, a function of T, I of T, if I wanted to. Um, I of T would be equal to dCV, okay, dT. <clears throat> now, the C can be brought out because it's constant. So it winds up being I, the current that we have here, is equal to the amount of capacitance in farads multiplied by the rate of change of the voltage. Now this is a very important equation right here. 
I didn't put a box around it or anything, but this is what we came out with. Current as a function of time is equal to a constant, C, multiplied by dV dt, the rate of change of the capacitor's voltage, which is the same as a source, with respect to time. So <clears throat> if we were to double the value of C, but keep the rate of change of voltage with respect to time as a constant, say one volt per second or two volts per second or whatever the case may be, doubling C doubles the amount of current, okay? Because we're basically charging a larger capacitor with our change in voltage and there has to be more charge over the time allotted. And that would mean that we're doubling the amount of current. Now, here's another way to look at this with an interval, kind of looking at it in reverse. But the voltage of a capacitor is going to be proportional to the integral of the current with respect to time, or the current times time. So this is going to be 1 over C, OK, uh, multiplied by the integral. It's a definite integral of I of T. That's actually a T. Uh, I of t dt. So current times time is charge, right? Remember? Why is that? Well, um, charge divided by time is current, isn't it? Charge divided by time is current. dq over dt. So if we take the dt and multiply it by i, we get the change in charge with respect to I times dt. When you integrate, you wind up uh, with a few substitutions. Here you have uh, the voltage across the capacitor is equal to one over C times the current with respect to time integrated over that time from T1 to T2. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the larger the capacitor, you put a big capacitor here where you removed a small capacitor, then what's going to happen is this one over a larger number is going to make this fraction a lot smaller. So the voltage is going to grow a lot smaller for the same amount of current over a period of time. Okay. So um, anyway, if, if you don't want to use an integral here, just use a constant amount of current, multiply it by time. So current divided by time current, excuse me, multiplied by time is going to be charge, okay? And then charge divided by C is going to be equal to voltage. So these two equations here govern the current and the voltage across the capacitor. Usually this is the one that you're the most interested in. Actually, this manifestation over here because we brought the C out of the derivative. Now, <clears throat> I went ahead, the book does this. It shows you what happens if you put two capacitors, and this is the symbol for capacitor, one straight line, one curve. Sometimes you see schematic software that has two parallel lines, and that's okay, but I prefer this. I'm old school. So CT, this is the total capacitance, and it's basically equal to C1 plus C2. You say, wait a minute, whoa, 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 wait. Resistors, we didn't do this with resistors. This was the, you know, R1 times R2 divided by R1 plus R2. So why is this different? It's different. Take my word for it. Essentially, what we're doing here, and let me let me give you some, some thought on that. Let's look at a mechanical drawing of a capacitor. Let's say that we're looking at it not as a schematic symbol, but actually as a mechanical device. Now, let's suppose that I take another capacitor and I put it right up here alongside the first capacitor. And I attach these two together. And I attach these two together. Remember, this is really divided right here. But this plate is essentially connected to this plate. And you could call that port A, and you could call this port B. And this plate's connected to this plate. So what we've done is we have effectively doubled the area of the capacitor. Now, in a mechanical drawing like this, if you keep the spacing of the capacitor the same, doubling the area will exactly double the amount of capacitance. So what we're doing here is we're, in this, we're basically doubling the area. 
Now, if I had two capacitors and I put them in series, here's one, I'm doing a mechanical drawing, and I'm just gonna not put the leads on the bottom of the first one, the top of the second one. But in other words, I've got this one's got a spacing of D and this one's got a spacing of D. So now what I have is I have two that are at two spacings. So that would be 2D. 2D or not 2D, that is the question. But anyway, so I've got double the spacing here and we're gonna learn very, very shortly that when you double the distance of the plates, your capacitance goes down to one half. So looking at this, essentially, if these are identical capacitors, and they do not have to be, but if they're identical capacitors, I've taken a D's worth of spacing here and a D's worth of spacing here and essentially made one capacitor with two D worth of spacing. So the capacitance will go down. Now, if I have a 10 microfarad here and a 10 microfarads here and I put them in series, I will have a half, excuse me, half of that, which would be five microfarads. So the equation for capacitors in series looks like this. CT is gonna be equal to one over one over C1 plus one over C2 plus et cetera. If you have three or four or five, you just keep adding terms in the denominator. Now, if you have two and only two, you can do the same thing we did with resistors in parallel, but these are in series. This would be C1 times C2 divided by C1 plus C2. So this is the way that you work these out. Using these rules, uh, we can combine capacitances, and I'll give you some problems later, where we'll work that all out. <clears throat> now, I want you to understand that we can have a vacuum in between the plates of the capacitor. If we go back to our capacitor here, and let me just draw one, one capacitor with two plates, the quintessential standard capacitor. We've got D's worth of spacing here, and we could make this positive, we can make that negative, put a charge across here. You have electric field running across that. Now, inside of this capacitor, uh, we could default and just say you've got a vacuum. I'll just write VAC. In other words, there's no air, there's nothing in here. So we have what's called free space, free space in that capacitor. <clears throat> now there is an equation where if we know a few things about the capacitor, we can calculate the amount of capacitance. Now, C in farads would be proportional to the area of the capacitor. And let me say this, if you've got a capacitor here, let's say this, this capacitor that we're looking at <clears throat> has, uh, let's say 10 square centimeters, okay? So this is 10 square centimeters, and this plate is 10 square centimeters. We don't double count that. That would be a capacitor with an area of 10 square centimeters. You don't double count each plate. Let me show you another thing. Suppose you had one plate <clears throat> that looked like this, and let's say that it had 10, um, let's do it this way, centimeters, this is better. The area is 10 centimeters squared. And let's say I've got another plate and it's not exactly on the first plate, it's offset a little bit, but it's also 10 centimeters squared. This is the only area that you count. The other area here is, is for practical purposes, generally not countable. So you would be looking here at only the overlap of the two plates and that would be your area. So what would that be? The area would be 2.5, centimeters squared. It would be a quarter of this because we're only using one quarter of the whole area here. <clears throat> you can't count them double. So it's not a quarter and a quarter giving you a half. That's not what it is. This is one quarter of 10 centimeters because that is the overlap between two 10 centimeter plates. All right, so that's the way that you do area. D is in meters. Area is in square meters, okay? And the capacitance is proportional. That doesn't look much like a proportionality, but anyway, it's proportional. <clears throat> so how do we actually make C 
into real fair eds if we have a plate area in square meters and we have a D in, in meters for spacing. Well, we introduce a concept. <clears throat> this is one of the fundamental concepts of nature. And this concept is called, now listen to the word very carefully. Uh, it's permittivity, permittivity. And if you ask me to spell that, I would tell you, I have no idea. Anyway, it's called permittivity. You can look it up in your book. And the little naught here, the little zero, signifies that we're talking about this constant of nature relating to free space. So epsilon, and that's the Greek letter here, epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. And the number that's associated with that is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. And it does have units. I didn't write them down here. But that's our value of epsilon naught. This is if your capacitor has vacuum in between the two plates as your dielectric. This is another word. This is material between the plates, dielectric. So if it's just a vacuum, then you've got epsilon naught, and that is your area once again in square meters, and this is the distance between the plates in meters. Now, mind you, this is a very, very small number. So if you had a, you know, if you had uh, say one meter here, one meter, and say this was a millimeter, then if you had a square meter, and this is one millimeter, it's 0 0.001, then, then you would have a thousand. When you divide this into one square meter, you would have a thousand. So basically, that would just move this by three decimal places, but it would still be an incredibly small number for the capacitance. So let me give you this uh, epiphany. Capacitors are one of the things, it's the only thing I can think of right now in electronics or electricity or electrical engineering, that the basic unit is so enormous that we don't see it in practice uh, almost ever. The farad is an unthinkable amount of capacitance for most applications. So something like this <clears throat> would be something like this would be um, a very tiny portion of a farad. Even if you multiply this number by a thousand, which would be our area uh, of one square meter divided by 0 0.001 meters, that would give you a thousand. So that'd move the decimal place three. But still, with a capacitance in that range, it is a small, small value. So what kind of capacitances do we normally see in electronics? Well, you'd be surprised. Um, it, it varies a lot. Like, for example, in power supplies, we would have a capacitor maybe. Let's say here's our capacitor. It's not much of a, it's not a very pretty capacitor. But anyway, um, in a power supply, we might have... Uh, Oh, it, it can go up above this, but let's say 10,000 micro farads. And you sometimes will express this in millifarads, but I'll tell you, a lot of times, a lot of times these capacitances are expressed in a very large number of micro farads. Um, one of the reasons behind this is the, uh, the prefixes. For example, milla looks like an M, and on a capacitor, years ago, they weren't able to put a mu sign, uh, which is essentially that, which is one times 10 to the minus six. So they would use an M, and uh, that would be microfarads. And they didn't even use mela because it's confusing to use it with M for microfarads stamped on the body of the device. And then you have micro microfarads. And years ago, they would actually write that this way. It's very, very unconventional. So this is kind of messed up, if you will. But uh, the capacitor I was telling you about, Big Blue, has 10,000 microfarads. Now, you can get capacitors way larger than this. You can get them way bigger than this. And I have seen some one farad capacitors, but they're expensive and they're few and far between. That is a huge amount of capacitance. Oh, by the way, if you have um, in electronics, if you have a field effect transistor, this is actually called an IGFET. 
um, this would be like an enhancement mode FET. This is what's used in, in digital electronics. It would be something like that. And, you know, this is, a, uh, this is an end channel uh, FET. Or um, actually another term is MOSFET. Uh, so a MOSFET is a metal oxide semiconductor. Now, <clears throat> to make this thing work, this is like a little capacitor and it is microscopic. You'd have to have a microscope to see it very, very tiny. And in between this material down here, which is P and N material, uh, y'all haven't seen that yet, but don't worry about it. But in between there, there's a little glass layer. This glass layer is like silicon oxide that's deposited on here. <clears throat> and it is, it's, it's like glass. It has an incredibly, incredibly high resistance. So virtually no current. If you put five volts on this, it just doesn't pass any current over to this stuff over here. Now that is very, very desirable because we can control voltage and current over here on this side. This is the drain and that's the source. And this is actually, by the way, called the gate. And I'm drawing this looking at the computer screen and not the actual pad. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, this has almost infinite resistance from the gate over here, but it does have some capacitance. So it actually looks like a little capacitor in between the gate and the source or a gate and the drain and that type of thing. Now, what would that be? Well, typically it's probably two to three pico farads. And that would be like 2.0 times 10 to the minus 12 or one, excuse me, two millionths of a millionth of a farad. So I take it a farad and dividing it by a million and then taking one of those parts and dividing it again by me, it is a very tiny number. And you would have maybe two or three of these little picofarads of capacitance here. You say, well, that's just not even enough to count. Well, normally in a lot of applications, it is not. But let me give you an example. What if this gate is going from zero volts to five volts to zero volts to five volts to zero volts to five volts? What if it's oscillating back and forth? This thing is charging and discharging, charging and discharging, charging and discharging. And as it goes through this process, it's actually taking some charge from somewhere and putting it on that gate. And then it's taking that charge and pulling it down to ground. <clears throat> so I have a current going in, I have a current going out, I have a current going in, I have a current going out. This is the reason that Pentium computer processors get hot. The larger the frequency of charging and discharging this little gate, even at these incredibly tiny capacitances, the charging and discharging of this gate winds up giving you a significant amount of charge discharge current. Now multiply that by millions of these transistors in one little integrated circuit. This is why people, I, I don't really understand this, but this is why you have gamers that go in there and they have to run water to their computer to cool their chip because this will get so hot that either the Pentium will go into a slowdown mode and shut the clock speed down to keep this thing from charging and discharging as quickly. You gotta remember, it's not just one, it's a whole bunch of them. You'll either have it shut down on its own or if it can't shut down, it will destroy the Pentium from heat. So that's why they put cooling jackets and extra cooling fins and everything you can imagine. One of them is a Peltier device, which is a solid state device used for pumping heat it takes energy and thermodynamically moves heat from a, um, a cold side to a hot side, which is against the flow of thermo in, in nature, against the flow of heat. But anyway, uh, so these are very, very small. And then on the other side, you, you've got something that's uh, maybe, uh, you know, 10 to the 12th larger than that capacitance right there. So it does vary a lot. Okay. Now, here's the deal. <clears throat> here's epsilon naught. So if we incorporate epsilon naught for a, a capacitor that has no other dielectric in between the plates, 
then what happens is we get an equation here that we can use to give us the capacitance. And mind you, even if this is in, you know, this is, you know, half a square meter, and that's a millimeter, it's still not a lot of capacitance. It's very, very small. Okay. So here's the deal on that. Can we put something in between the plates of the capacitor? Let's go back over here. Let's go back to our physical plates. And I got these two plates here. Okay. And this is going to have a certain amount of capacitance. So let's say it's going to have uh, 0 0.01 microfarad. So it's a pretty good size plate and the spacing is not that much. Now, I can take, and I'm going to draw these plates sort of two-dimensional rather than lines. This is a metal plate. And I am going to take a material and I'm going to slide it in between these two metal plates, just like this, taking up all the free space in here. And this material <clears throat> is called a dielectric. <clears throat> Excuse me. This material is called a dielectric. Now, a dielectric that you would use in a capacitor <clears throat> is going to have a electrically polarized molecule in it. And it's going to be a very polar molecule. And when you put a, a, a voltage up here, say you make this one positive and this one negative, you create electric field. Well, those polar molecules line up in the electric field. They're basically dipole moments. And they line up with their negative and positive end inside of this. And it actually enhances the amount of charge that you can put on the plates. So you really made a better capacitor by putting this dielectric material in between the plates. So we say that there is a dielectric All right, dielectric constant, C-O-N-S-T-A-N-T, -N -T, constant, dielectric constant. Now we normally represent that, normally represent that, or many times represent it as capital K. Now this is not the same K that we see in um, other areas of electronics or like Coulomb's law or anything like that. This is not the same constant, okay? This constant right here is actually dimensionless. It has no dimensions whatsoever. So K could be equal to uh, two, it could be equal to a hundred, et cetera. And by putting it in here, what we've done is we've actually rearranged our equation for capacitance. And now it is C, the capacitance would be equal to uh, K times epsilon naught, times the area divided by the distance between the plates. So we've introduced this in the numerator and K is a dimensionless number. So the dimensions here, they're not affected by K because it doesn't have a dimension. All this does is to say, if I put K here in here and it has a value of two or a dielectric constant of two, then this 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor goes to a 0 0.02 microfarad uh, capacitor. Now, if I put 100, you say, is that large? Well, no, not that large, believe it or not. But if I put a dielectric constant material in here that has a dielectric constant of 100, then literally, I'm going to take this original amount of capacitance and multiply it by 100. So I will have a 1 microfarad capacitor rather than a 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor. We're going to move that decimal two places to the right. You might say, you mean to tell me you put a material in there and this capacitor goes from a hundredth of a microfarad to a full microfarad? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Now, what is the range of dielectric constant? Well, uh, if you put air in here, if you really have two plates here, 99.99% .99 of the time, it's not going to be in space. So there will be air in here. Air is a very good insulator. It does have the ability to break down at a certain voltage, but it's a good insulator. And air has a dielectric constant of 
I don't know, but you can look it up, but it's 1.000, et cetera. It's just a little bit more than one because a vacuum has a dielectric constant of one. In other words, if you put one here, why even leave the K there? Just go to epsilon naught A divided by D. So <clears throat> K is dielectric constant and it is an amplification factor based on the type of material that you put in between the plates. But now keep in mind that if you do not get this material all the way up against both plates, and it is an insulating material, so it's not allowing current to flow here to any extent, uh, you got to get it all the way up, fill the entire area to make this work. If there's a little gap here, then essentially you have one capacitor with less than D spacing with a dielectric constant of whatever, and you got another one up here that's probably got air in there. So you got another capacitor in series that's just got air in between the plates, but a small D spacing. And that will diminish the amount of capacitance that you actually get from this. Now, <clears throat> with this said, the constant is K, but there's another way to write this. We can write this as epsilon sub R. Epsilon sub R is called relative permittivity, and it is just like K, it is dimensionless. So you got a dielectric constant of K, you have relative permittivity of two. You know, if this is two, that's two. Okay. Now we could rewrite the equation and say C, just like this, is going to be uh, epsilon naught times epsilon R times A divided by D. We could write it like that. That's totally okay. We could also write it this way. Epsilon, <coughs> epsilon sub M is the permittivity of the material, permittivity of the material itself, in other words, the dielectric. And it is going to be equal to the permittivity of free space times the relative permittivity. So we could write it this way. We could write epsilon sub M, and that incorporates both of these, uh, times A divided by D. And that's just another way to write the whole thing. Okay. By the way, it's interesting. It's very, very interesting. I'm not going to go into it. But, you know, I told you there's this reciprocity throughout electricity between current voltage, capacitance, inductance, etc. And uh, anyway, when you start, <clears throat> when you start looking at some of these things like uh, permittivity and everything, uh, the other constant, which I am not going to explain or get into right now, but it's called the permeability of free space, and it deals with inductors. This is for capacitors, this is for inductors. Electric field here, magnetic field over here. So there's another one of these constants. And actually, it was James Clark Maxwell that took this constant and uh, this constant, permittivity of free space, took those two and developed a formula where when you divided it out, you came up with a number, and guess what that number was? The speed of light, because electromagnetic radiation, which is light, travels at a fixed speed, and he actually forecasted using these two numbers, constants of the universe, he formulated the speed at which waves travel in the medium, and he was incredibly close. They didn't have perfect figures for these back in the 1800s, but he got it. He nailed it, and it is an amazing piece of work. They said that Maxwell just couldn't make an error. Said he was, his mind was like a steel trap. Anything that he thought about, he made no errors. I wish I could be more like Maxwell, but anyway, this is the, this is the stuff on capacitors. Now, there's a few other things that uh, I need to show you. And uh, one of them is this. This is U. And a lot of times we use a capital U and put a subscript with it to denote energy. So what happens if I charge a capacitor? Well, I've actually done work. It's electrical work, but it's not that dissimilar to actual mechanical work, force times distance. But we put some charge in there with the voltage. We had to push it to get it in there. So we did work putting that charge in there. Well, we've got stored potential energy. 
This is actually potential energy that is related to the capacitance and the amount of voltage across the capacitor. This is in joules. This, of course, is a half. This is in farads, not microfarads. Be careful there. And this is in volts. So let's just say that I had a, um, let's just say I had a, a 0.1 farad capacitor. Now that's huge capacitor. And let's say that I put uh, 10 volts across it. Okay, that has to be squared. I still got to have the half here. So when I look at this, 10 squared would be 100. Okay, and times 0.1 would be 10 again, and then times that would be 5. So I would wind up having uh, five joules of energy stored in that capacitor. Everybody see that? Okay, capacitance in farads, volts in volts, okay? But that has to be squared. You know, this is very, very, very similar to another equation for kinetic energy in physics. There's some parallels here. Remember, kinetic energy is one half m v squared and the amount of kinetic energy you have goes up with the square of the velocity and this goes up with the square of the voltage okay all right um by the way i'm, I'm going to show you something i got a little space over here um when i was in physics and this is right after uh, right after newton died I, I didn't get to meet him but nevertheless, um, when I was in physics back in the dark ages, uh, our professor told us something that I found very interesting. And let me show you what he did. He said, let's say that you got two metal plates and these two metal plates are maybe an inch apart, okay? And anyway, we attach a voltage source here and let's say we put uh, 10,000 volts. You know, that seemed like a lot of voltage, but we've got ways of going way higher than 10,000 volts. So we put 10,000 volts across this, okay? And if we bring a wire from here to here, like any capacitor, we're allowing the charge to neutralize. It flows from one plate to the other. It goes back to zero volts. Now, let's suppose that I put a material, and I think he said it was styrofoam, but I don't remember the dielectric constant of styrofoam, but we'll just say you got a material here that's non-conductive. See, so here's the ends of the plates right here. So I've got something in here that's got uh, K equal to, uh, let's say five or something, okay? I tell you what, let's make this simple. Let's say K is equal to two. Okay, so that, that double the amount of capacitance. I put my voltage across these plates and let's say make this one positive and make that one negative. So I've got 10,000 volts across these two plates and I've got this dielectric material in between here, sandwiched between the two plates very closely, but not gripped by the two plates. And I have now enhanced the capacitance. So what have I done? If I look at this, uh, original, yeah, yeah, it's over here. So, if I look at this original equation here, what I have done is I've basically taken the same voltage, got 10,000 volts on here, and I don't know how many uh, farads or microfarads or picofarads or whatever I've got, but I know that I, I have two C. Okay. Okay. So, um, I've got this enhanced, okay? Now, I've got a charge on it. The amount of charge that I have on it is fixed. I had taken the source off, the, the current cannot flow back through the source. So what charge Q I've got on these plates is constant. It is constant. Okay, now I grip, and I might add very carefully, I grip this piece of styrofoam and I pull it out from between the two plates. I literally pull it out. Now, when I do that, look at this. Uh, Q is equal to C times V. But my capacitance went down. We, we haven't changed Q. Q is on the plates here, not the styrofoam. So what we've done here is I've taken C down 
50 percent. I've taken it from whatever it was to half of its original value because I pull a dielectric out. What's going to happen to the voltage? Same amount of charge. I just lowered the capacitance. The voltage has to go up. So it went down by a factor of two. The voltage goes up by a factor of two, and the product of the two is the same because you can't change the charge. It's on the plates. We didn't pull any charge off of it. Now, come over here and look at this equation again. Look at this. So what happens here is I just took C down by a factor of two and I took V up by a factor of two. But wait a minute, wait a minute. I got a problem here because look, C is not squared. Now I took C from two to one, whatever. And I took V from one to two. But look, whatever this is, it's squared. So the two has to be squared too. So now this, this value here went down by a half, but this one went up by a factor of four. So the amount of energy by this equation doubled. And what did I do to get the energy to double? This is what my professor in physics was, was telling us. And I was glued to this. I got twice as much energy stored in this capacitor by the equations when I pulled the dielectric out. Why? Because when I did... Uh, this voltage goes from 10,000 to 20,000 volts, but this has to be squared in the energy, and I take C, and I, I halved it. So it, it results in a much larger amount of energy stored in the capacitor. Now, think about conservation of energy. Where the heck did the energy go? Where is it? Where is that energy? Will the true energy please stand up? Well, the truth of the matter is, if you do pull this styrofoam or whatever it is, it may not be a factor of two, but when you do pull it out, you do have more energy in that capacitor. This is not something that's uh, pie in the sky. This is real. You will actually increase the energy of the capacitor. Now, how do you increase the energy of a system? You know, under the laws of thermodynamics, you cannot increase the energy in a system unless you do work on it. So where did the work come from? Remember in physics, work in joules is equal to force dot S. These are both vectors, but I'm not gonna get into all. But force times distance, you do work. Guess what? When you grabbed onto that thing and you pulled on it, you had to apply a force to get the thing out from the capacitor, uh, out from the capacitor. And you moved it a distance S. Now, this is not a constant, okay? These are not constant forces. Maybe the total S would be, but the forces are going to vary. But here's the deal. When you pull it out, you did work on it. So the increased energy in the capacitor electrically came from you doing work. It came from you doing work on it. Now, the professor, I remember his name was Robert Roger. Uh, that's like Robert Robert in French. But anyway, uh, Dr. Roger says he's seen this demonstration. And when you take that styrofoam, you're holding it out. You're away from the capacitor. You take the styrofoam and you sort of put the edge right back up to the plates like that and inch it in a little bit. So you can start feeling this capacitor pulling on you. And if you turn it loose, it'll actually vibrate. It'll fly back and forth and finally settle out in the middle and dissipate that by moving some air around as it oscillates back and forth. But it'll go back to the middle and it will do work on the styrofoam until it's pushed air back and forth and that air eventually carries the energy off in the form of heat. So you'll get the energy back. And I've had some ideas, I'm not gonna share them right here, but I've had some ideas about patents on something. I just don't think it would be efficient enough, but a method of actually generating um, electrical energy from this process. It's, it's an intriguing process. Of course, we only deal in here with intriguing things, right? Okay. All right. Now, let's look at one other thing, and we'll temporarily leave capacitors. I'm sorry that my drawing is not better, but as I said, I'd be a liberal arts major maybe, and that would, oh my god. Anyway, here is the voltage that's actually a V and it's an afterthought to put up T here, but that's VC of T. 
And uh, this is site positive and this is negative down here. And so time is on this axis. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start right here with no voltage across the capacitor. I've got a source, I've attached it, zero voltage. And then very gradually, I'm going to ramp that voltage up to this point right here. This is gonna be like one volt, two volts, three volts, four volts, five volts, whatever the case may be. Um, but I'm gonna have a steady linear increase in that voltage. Now, let's go back and look at the current equation. And it says that the current is equal to C, C is a constant, times dV dt. So the change in voltage with respect to time divided by the change in time, and we're doing this as a derivative, this is the rate of change of voltage with respect to time, is gonna give us a current. So if we look down here, what you see is a constant upward slope gives us initially a current here. When this slope begins to rise, when it begins, this is gonna be level across here. This is gonna be the current through the capacitor, I sub C. So it'll be constant as long as this is rising. Because what happens if you take the first derivative here? Well, you get a number. That number is the current. What if you take it here? or here, or here, or here, or here. All of those give me a constant rate of change because that's a straight line, it's linear. So when I take the derivative, I get a constant. But then up here, it doesn't go to zero. I've still got voltage across the capacitor, but I don't increase it or decrease it for this period from here to here. Well, as soon as I stop increasing it, my current drops immediately to zero. There's no more charge going in or out of the capacitor. And it stays there until I reach this point right here, which is that point. Now, I didn't do this real well, but I've got a, uh, I've got a, a steeper decline. Well, this is a slope, but it's negative. And what happens is that's gonna wind up giving us a very negative uh, value of current down here. It's going to be more negative than this was positive. And it's only going to exist between here and here. That is between here and here. And then if I sort of exponentially increase this, I sort of exponentially increase the current because the slope, this current is always going to be equal to the slope of the line here multiplied by uh, or divided actually by C. So we can differentiate um, with this device. Anyway, okay. Now, you know everything there is to know about capacitors. Let me, let me pause this uh, stimulating simulation. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dig around here in my lab. And like I said, I don't promise you large capacitors because we don't usually have any. But I'll see what I can find, and I'll be back in a second and uh, show you a capacitor or two. Just hang on. Sorry to keep you so long. I, I have. <laughs> I hunted my uh, lab over for large capacitors, and I had an, I had my own version of an epiphany. I'm still looking, but I didn't see any larger capacitors. Now this is this is crazy because I would have really realized. I would have thought that somewhere in here I'd have a, a larger example of a capacitor, physically larger. I did find this, and I'll show you show you a couple of things. I did find one interesting capacitor. This is a uh, circuit board. Let me cut to this and show you what I'm looking at here. Um, I kept this right here as a uh, just sort of a souvenir. I, uh, as you know, I told you I built a submarine back in the 90s and the technology back in the 90s wasn't anything like what it is today. I didn't have the ability to generate a printed circuit board very well. So what I had to do, I think it's better if I put it here. Yeah, much better. Anyway, I had to use what's called wire wrap. I made a few wire connections on the back of this board. This is actually the way I used to build micro computers and so forth uh, using a wire wrap. See, this is my legend about which which terminal, which wire goes where and what. This was built in the 90s. 
And this was part of the system that, and this is only one module, but this is part of the system that controlled things on my submarine, reported data to me in the console and, and all of that. That's a micro uh, controller. And a uh, little window here, quartz window, allows you to have uh, ultraviolet C, UVC light from a source that I have to go through there and it would actually erase that and you could reprogram it. These are voltage regulators here and these are various chips. This right here is an example of a capacitor. That is a capacitor right here. Here's another one. These are resistors. And here's a capacitor. This capacitor right here is placed directly across uh, this, this chip here. And this was put here because I needed to do what's called bypassing. And this is a 0.1 microfarad bypass capacitor. Those are very standard issues. Now here's some sort of, uh, I don't know what this is, probably a, a filter of some sort. Here's capacitors lined up here. Here's some resistors. These are potentiometers. Here's a capacitor, here's a capacitor, here's a capacitor. Now, oh, and here's a standard, what's called a disc ceramic. And this is also a disc ceramic capacitor. And I think that's one there, yeah. And these are tantalum. It just has to do with the type of capacitor. Here's some bigger tantalums. These tantalums are used where you bring power into the system. It's sort of as a filter. There's another, uh, and there's, there's a, another look at a disc ceramic, just a different uh, type of capacitor, but nevertheless, they are capacitors. 7662, this converts a positive voltage to a negative voltage to drive operational amplifiers. Anyway, uh, pretty neat little, little device. A 308, that's an op amp. Okay. Anyway, I, I did this in about 30 minutes. No, I'm just joking. Anyway, so you got to see that. Here's one for you. Look at this. I don't even know where I got this. I didn't get it off the power line, so don't go reporting me. Um, it's a little bit not right to read for the camera, but it says uh, right here, you can't read this, but I'll read it to you. It says type, gives you a type, type 1960. I have no idea what that means. And it says MFD. Now to tell you how screwy this gets, this is an older capacitor. It's a power line capacitor, very high voltage capacitor. And this is a 0.0043 MFD, microfarads. Yes, that is right. And it says uh, peak, it says P-E-A-K right here. And over here it says W-K-G volts. And I do need to cover that with you. And, um, it says ambient temperature or something Celsius 60, maximum ambient temperature 60. But anyway, it says 8,000 here. So this is an 8,000 volt capacitor. And right here, you can't eh, you barely see that. It says mica capacitor. And it tells you how many amps. Now this is probably not a power line capacitor because it's uh, it wouldn't have that many amps at that microfarad and voltage. Well, it might. Anyway, I'm not sure. Could be out of a transmitter, high power transmitter. Anyway, a bunch of, it's a nameplate on here. And this thing's very expensive, but I have no, made in the USA before we got everything from China. But this is a capacitor. This is, this is one electrode and here's the other electrode. Never used it for anything. It, I have a, uh, I have a case in my machine shop and I got some cases in here with collectibles. Anyway, in my uh, machine shop, I actually have a, uh, a case where I uh, keep stuff like this. It's kind of neat. Like a little museum. I need to put myself in it. Okay, I want to show you, uh, I'm going to show you something else about capacitors. I just happened to think about by showing you that those capacitors. Um, if you have a dielectric and let's say that, let's say here's your plate. Okay. And here's your other plate. Like so. And you got your dielectric material extended in here. Normally 
Well, it can overlap the plate, but you only count the plate area. But this is your dielectric. Now, keep in mind that this right here, this is D. The width of the dielectric in this case is the distance between the plates. Kind of got that. And anyway, um, when you put a voltage across here, you're going to have an electric field set up. And if you put too much voltage from here to here, you will actually damage this capacitor because there will be an electrical arc from here to here or from here to here. And once that occurs, it's actually going to leave a little channel that's open where another arc can come through here. So you will normally destroy a capacitor. If you use a voltage greater than the working voltage of the capacitor, it will break down. Now, here's an interesting fact. Not all dielectrics, they have no constitutional rights. They are not created equal. These, uh, these dielectrics may be something as simple as paper. They used to use paper a lot. This is back in the old, old days, like 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. They had paper. And then they learned to put wax on it and use wax paper. And no, I don't think craft wax paper ever went into the capacitor business. But nevertheless, they use a lot of different materials here for dielectrics. They found that among the best dielectrics, as far as the amount of voltage you could put a, across them, one of them was mica, M-I-C. It's a mineral and it cleaves in sheets, which makes it kind of easy to cleave a sheet. And normally they would put silver. They would deposit silver on one edge and silver on the other edge here. And this would be fairly small, say about the size of a thumbnail. And it would become a silver mica capacitor, silver mica. Now, mica has an extremely good dielectric, uh, I think it's dielectric constant or relative permittivity is five, if my memory serves. And it has a very large ability to withstand voltage. So you can make it very thin. Remember, the thinner you make these sheets, the closer these plates are, the closer the plates are, the more capacitance you have. That is the trick. There's two ways to, well, there's really three ways to make a capacitor larger. Make the plates bigger. Sometimes that's not feasible. Make the distance in here smaller. And the other one is to find something that has a higher dielectric constant. But you're always playing off against the idea that if I make D too small, no matter what the dielectric is, and I put too much voltage for the type of material and the distance, the thickness of that material, I get an arc here and it will ruin my capacitor. By the way, you know, I was talking about dielectric uh, constants up to like 100. There is a material called barium strontium titanate, which is a ceramic. And this ceramic material, get this, has a dielectric constant, K or epsilon sub R, equal to 7,500. Remember, it's dimensionless. 7,500. So you got a microfarad capacitor, you put this in between the plates, you get a 7,500 microfarad capacitor. But keep in mind, um, they do use this for capacitors and they get the plates down to a certain thickness. But if you go below that and put too much voltage, it's had it. Okay. So they rate capacitors. Um, for example, you might look at a capacitor. Uh, spec sheet and it say 50V, or sometimes it'll say 50V DC. This is very common. This stands for 50 volts direct current. Now, what you have to understand when you're dealing with capacitors, if you put alternating current across a capacitor, and we will talk about this later on, but not today, alternating current looks like this, okay? And if it's 120 volts, like wall outlet, you know, it's about right here. The peaks, the peak voltage right here of the wall outlet is about 169 and some change. So almost 170 volts here, negative 170 volts here with respect to ground. Now here's the deal. If I were to say, I'm going to get a capacitor and I'm gonna get a capacitor that's 130, and sometimes it'll be labeled this way, WVDC working volts DC. So 
In a case like this, the dielectric is not guaranteed to withstand over 130 volts at any time. But if you're plugging it into the wall, you say, well, I got 120, so I got 10 volts to spare here. Well, actually what happens is this goes up to 170 almost and then back down and negative 170, positive 170. So this oscillates back and forth and gets up to much higher voltages. And when it's in this region up here, you get your little lightning discharge between the two plates. So you have to be very careful. What is the peak voltage this thing is gonna to have to, to take? By the way, uh, when you're dealing with these figures here like this, uh, there are ways of actually depositing a material and then depositing a metal and then the material and then the metal and then the material and the metal and then connecting every other piece of metal over here on one side and every other piece of metal on the other side and making a, uh, a stack, if you will. And these are, uh, these are a new type of capacitor and they really have very, very uh, good capacitive characteristics at relatively high voltages and very, very small space. Very, very small space. Now, one might ask, um, if you need a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, where do you get one? Well, you could just take two very small plates, put something like that in between them, doesn't even have to be that high, and you could easily generate that in a very, very small, physically uh, small something, maybe literally that size or smaller. Some of these, uh, are so small, I don't even think the camera would pick them up. The capacitors that I use are usually about that big, physically. Okay, um, show you one. This is uh, one of my boards here. And uh, that right there is a 2.2 microfarad. I just remembered that. And I've got a couple, I can't even see them hardly without a microscope. Um, one of these is, I think, a 10 microfarad, and the other one is a 1 microfarad. My memory serves me. But see, they're surface mounted. They're very, very tiny. Very, very tiny. That's usually what I deal with when I talk about capacitors. Very seldom use larger capacitors, although we can certainly get them and use them. Let me, uh, before I move on, I keep thinking about things to tell you about capacitors. Um, how do you get a lot of capacitance? What if you need a 500 microfarad capacitor or a 10,000 microfarad capacitor and you want to get it in a small space? You don't want to take something that's bigger than the electronic project you're building. So what you would do there, one of the techniques to use there is to take a layer of aluminum foil, okay? There's a layer of aluminum foil. And then they put a gauze, now this is an old fashioned technique, they put a gauze, just like medical gauze, and they lay that on top of the aluminum with a paste. Now, years ago, this paste, if you actually tore into capacitor, it looks, it kind of looks like flour and water. It's, it's sort of a watery looking paste. And then what they do, they got the gauze in here, and then they lay another layer of aluminum foil on here. And uh, by the way, they bring one of these out one side and one of these out the other. And then they put some more gauze and paste up here. So you've got like gauze and paste, aluminum, gauze and paste, and aluminum. And then what they do is they roll this thing up like a jelly roll. And you'll have one inside the other. They never are supposed to touch. Okay. So this would be, let's say you make that positive and that negative. And the, the electrolyte, the material, the paste that they put in here, it's moist. The paste that they put in there gives you, they give you a little bit of separation with the gauze. So, but really at numerous places inside of this freshly manufactured capacitor, you actually have these plates touching each other. Okay, so they will touch at, at places, but not a lot. Now, the object of this game is to go to the basic capacitor equation, which is, let's just say, cut to the chase and say uh, uh, the permittivity of the material, which is uh, permittivity of free space multiplied by the dielectric constant of the dielectric times the area, which would be the overall area of one of these aluminum strips, 
that you're rolling up divided by D. Well, obviously, as I said earlier, you can make the capacitor have more capacitance by making the, uh, the area larger. But you can also make D smaller. How small can you make D? You can make it pretty small. So the object would be to roll this thing up real tightly. So these are really just sort of uh, crushed together. And if you measured the resistance between these two terminals, if you measured the resistance across those two terminals, what you would find is um, it would be fairly low. In other words, current flowing into one terminal or one strip would make enough contact with the other strip that you would actually get a current flow across it. Well, that's not good. You don't want that. Okay, so what we do is we take our newly formed capacitor, our jelly roll, and we put it across a variable source. And I'm going to put an arrow across here. And I'm going to take one end of the foil and attach it there. And I'll take the other end of the foil and attach it there. Now I'm going to come in here. I don't know what they start with, but it's a very, very small amount of voltage. And there's a current that flows in here, goes in one plate, comes out the other, which is not at all what we want from a capacitor. But we put a little voltage there and we leave it for a while. We let it cook. And here's what happens. <clears throat> This electrolyte has a current, it has a potential across it. And the material in between the plates has aluminum um, as part of the compound. Um, I don't know what the chemical composition of it is, but what happens is it has, uh, well, I don't know that it's so much aluminum as it is an oxidizing agent. And when you put a current across here, one surface of these two that are separated by the thin, gauze and so forth, one of these two surfaces begins to develop a layer of oxide. So if you get a little oxide on one of those plates and the other one's right up against it, you might say. Well, the longer you leave this voltage across here and the more of this chemical action that takes place and the more oxidized one of these aluminum plates becomes, by the way, aluminum oxide, um, I think, I'm not sure, but AL304, I think, is standard alumina. But anyway, uh, this aluminum oxide is one of the hardest materials outside of a diamond. And it is extremely hard. It has a really hard structure, and it's an extremely good insulator. So <clears throat> any place that can get this current flowing develops a layer of this oxide. That is your dielectric. That is D. When these things collapse together, that's going to be D. And it's going to be a very, very thin. This is called an electrolytic capacitor. There's examples in the book that talk about this. But the electrolytic capacitor gets its large capacitance, not from large areas, although physically these are oftentimes larger than your standard capacitor. But it gets its larger capacitance from D. Now, there's a problem here. There's a fly in the ointment, so to speak. And that is because this is very thin and this little alumina layer is very, very thin. Normally an electrolytic capacitor does not allow you to have a lot of voltage across it because these might be 10 volts, 100 volts, uh, 50 volts. That's pretty, pretty high. Uh, the one I have in the lab in uh, Shreveport is 250 volts with so big blue. So it's a very, very rare electrolytic capacitor. But normally their voltage ratings are lower. And there's another problem with electrolytics that I want you to be aware of. If you ever design anything, say, I want to use electrolytic capacitor. There's two other things here that, that at least two things that you really need to know. One of them is the voltage. Every time you use this capacitor, and let me draw a symbol for the capacitor. It's going to have a positive and it's going to have a negative. These capacitors are made with a polarity. Okay. It's the same polarity as they were set up with when they cooked in. By the way, after you leave um, a voltage on this for a while and you begin to build that aluminum layer, you increase this voltage and then you let it cook for a little bit longer. Then you increase the voltage and you keep going with that until you reach 
at least or more than your working voltage that they're going to rate the capacitor for. They're going to go above that until that fully cooks in and it's ready to take the charge without breaking down and arcing in the middle. I have seen these things literally explode violently. Um, it's interesting. Okay, but you have to have a lot of current to be able to do that. So anyway, uh, these will forever have a polarity. What happens if you hook them up in the wrong polarity? Well, what happens is the aluminum that has the oxide tries to deplate and move the oxide to the other plate because of the change in polarity. And when it does, you start eating the oxide away from this plate to deposit over there. And in this process, you get an arc between the plates and it's gone. So they will destroy themselves if you operate them in reverse polarity for very long. The other thing about electrolyte capacitors is they have a shelf life. If you put one of these in a piece of equipment, and I really try to avoid electrolytics of this aluminum electrolytics of this type. If you put one of these in a piece of equipment, what will happen is if you don't turn that equipment on, over a long period of time, this oxide begins to sort of deplate over here from the metal. And then you suddenly turn the unit on and put just the working voltage that it's always been able to take and the capacitor fails. I, I had a printer one time back in the 70s. I bought a, a couple of printers. They were like $800 back in those days. I brought one home with me when I left Houston, came back up to this area of North Louisiana, where I'm from. And when I, I had the thing in storage for years, then one of my printers went out and I went and got this printer, plugged it in, turned it on, and smoke starts rolling out of the printer. It was an electrolytic capacitor. It had been on the shelf too long, and these deteriorate if they're not used. However, if you use them, you're putting a voltage, the same polarity as created them. So it replates everything, that keeps everything plated correctly. But still they have a finite life, especially at higher temperatures. Uh, they may be rated only for a thousand, 2000 hours of operation at hundred degrees Celsius or something. So you have to watch the operating temperature of these and they're really flaky. The other, uh, one other thing I actually didn't think about is they have like uh, 20 to 50% tolerance. So if this thing's supposed to be 100 microfarads, it might be 50 microfarads, it may be 150 microfarads. Or if it's rated at 100, it might be 80, if it's a better one, it might be 80 or it may be 120. You said, well, how, how do you stand a tolerance like that? Doesn't that mess your circuit up? Well, no, if you're using these as a power supply filter, that's okay. Just put a bigger one in there than you need, even including the tolerance. And having a 50% tolerance may not really affect anything at all. You just need a one dinger big amount of capacitance in the circuit. And these are relatively small. So the capacitive density of an electrolytic is, is large. It's fairly large, okay? All right. Um, I'm thinking here. Um, so this is this is one of your one of your areas, electrolytics. Uh, another one, another type of electrolytic is called a tantalum. It's made with the element tantalum, and those are much better, much much better. So tantalum electrolytics um, operate much better. They're far more reliable. They have closer tolerances. So what's the downside of a tantalum? Cost. They cost more. Now, my philosophy is I'm not, I don't make production stuff, you know, where you build in cheapness. So if I am building a piece of equipment, designing a piece of equipment for myself, like I'm doing my sub uh, systems over, uh, I, I usually pay for the better product because I know I'm not going to have a problem with it later, or at least have a good idea. I'm not going to have something fail. So in my submarine redesign, I don't think I've got a single electrolytic capacitor. I don't even think I've got a tantalum in there anywhere. I try to avoid that if possible, but sometimes you have to, okay? All right. Um, oh, let me let me show you this. I keep, I didn't have good notes here, so I'm, I'm seeing this a little bit at a time. Let's look at the model for capacitor. Actually, there are numerous models. Now that's an ideal capacitor. You know, you could say, well, it's 10 microfarads, okay. And it has, you'll see 50V up here, which means that you can operate it at 50 volts and you're okay. 
can you operate it at 25 volts? I remember as a, I was about 14 years old, 15 maybe, and I was learning electronics. I had an older friend who later on worked for me, and he's a good friend of mine. I've known him virtually all my life. And I said, Jim, I said, uh, this circuit calls for a 50 volt capacitor. Uh, I said, I got a hundred volt cap. I said, will that work? He said, yeah, you can go over the 50, but you can't go under the 50. So keep that in mind. Known that ever since I was 15, that was well, probably 30 years ago. And uh, anyway, uh, if you got a 50 volt capacitor and you're only gonna use five volts, of it's okay. But it's typically gonna be larger. If the voltage rating is larger, it'll be more reliable because you're not getting anywhere near the maximum operating voltage. So the capacitor may be larger and more reliable, but it may be more expensive, probably will be. And it's totally okay to do that. Just don't go over the working voltage. As a matter of fact, I don't even like, I, I basically take a circuit, if it's 10 volts, I'll put at least, generally at least a 20 volt working volt capacitor across it. Anyway, perfect capacitor will be able to withstand the 50 volts and the, it'll have 10 microfarads and there will be no resistance whatsoever in this mid region. So if I were to really say, let's say ask myself the question perhaps, what does this capacitor really look like? Well, a slightly more complex model of the capacitor might emerge that looks like this. So there's many models of the capacitor that include things like inductance, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, series, parallel resistance. There's also some series resistance in the model, but I just wanted to show you um, this sort of the standard look at something like an electrolytic would have a resistor here. And this resistor is oftentimes designated as RP. This would be the parallel resistance of that um, particular capacitor. Now, if this is a mica capacitor, mica has an incredible uh, resistance. It's almost infinity for the little bit of mica that they use. So the equivalent, this is not a real resistor, this is an equivalent resistance that is viewed, really it's resistance from plate to plate, but it's viewed as a model by putting the RP, the parallel resistance out here, spanning across the capacitor's terminal. So RP here is gonna be the effective parallel resistance of this. If it's mica, this is gonna be way up in the mega ohms or gig ohms. If this is an electrolytic, you have an aluminum electrolytic, not a tantalum, but aluminum one. Uh, this is gonna be way, way lower. You want this to be infinity because you don't want any current to be able to flow through the dielectric, but it does. And the current that flows through the dielectric or leaks around the dielectric in the capacitor is represented by this parallel value right here. And by the way, in something like an electrolytic capacitor, this value can vary drastically from one capacitor to another. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you something. Let's suppose you say, I want to parallel capacitors. That's not a problem. You take electrolytes, just just parallel them and hook them all up top and bottom, you're good to go. Not a problem. But what if I say, hey, I want to series two capacitors. Oh, I've got batteries here. Duh. Not watching what I'm doing. Draw so many batteries. Let's put two capacitors here. And across those two capacitors, here's where my battery was meant to come in. Okay, so I've got a battery. Let's say I've got 10 volts on that battery. And here's C1 and here's C2, okay? And these are, we could say these are identical capacitors. These are totally identical. So each one of these is a uh, 10 microfarads. There's down here, you got 10 microfarads. Now you say, can I do that? Yeah, you can do it. But here's a problem. If you look at the parallel resistance of C2, it would be this, we'll call this RP2. And across C1, it's got its own parallel resistance. And let's call this RP1. Now, let's just say that, uh, you know, 
when they manufactured these, let's say that this is uh, 100K, that's fairly low number, with some capacitors have that lower resistance. And say this one over here is, uh, let's say this turns out to be 900K, just to make things work out. Of course, these are K ohms. Now, when you throw the switch and put this 10 volts across these two capacitors, the amount of current flowing into these capacitors are gonna be way larger than the current in these two resistors. So it's gonna initially behave as though these capacitors didn't have this resistance here. But here's the deal. When you leave the 10 volts on here, even though initially this capacitor will charge, remember Kirchhoff's law works with everything, including capacitors, this capacitor right here being equal to this one will charge to five volts and this one will charge to five volts. So I've got 10 volts, I'm dropping five here, dropping five here. So I'm applying 10, I'm losing five here, I'm losing five there. That's the way it's supposed to be. But now after these charge, after these charge, these resistances come into play, if you will. And now I have a voltage divider. Here I've got 100K and down here I've got 900K. So over a period of time, this capacitor right here will lose its charge. This capacitor will gain charge. And what will happen is the voltage across C1 will wind up since you're applying 10. The voltage across C1 proportionally will be one volt. The voltage across C2 will be nine volts. So I got nine volts and one volt. Well, that's equal to the 10. But what if these capacitors are rated at five volts each, and that's their maximum working voltage? This one's okay because it's got one volt across. You're good to go there. But this has got nine volts across a five volt capacitor, and this one can blow. So the problem here is you can do this, but you have to be very, very cognizant of the fact that you do have equivalent parallel resistances here, and these parallel resistances wind up dividing, if this is on here for a long time, this will divide the voltage and the charge on the two capacitors, one will creep down and one will creep up unless these are the same value. And that's very, very difficult because they don't, they don't really nail this down for you when you buy the capacitor. It's really, a, as they say, a crapshoot as to what you're gonna get over here. It'll be within a range. But it could be something as drastic as that. This is a much better capacitor than that one because it has a much higher parallel resistance. So be careful there. Okay. Um, let me show you, let me give you a problem. Um, let's suppose we take a battery. And with this battery, and once again, just to make things easy, we're going to use 10 volts. I'm going to change pencils here. Maybe I got a sharper one. Okay, so I got a 10 volt battery. And over here, I've got a, um, let's say this is a, um, let's say this is two microfarads. Okay. And I've got another capacitor here. And we'll say that this one is eight microfarads. Okay. Now I'm applying 10 volts to a two and an eight. Now, first of all, how much total capacitance do I have here? It's not two plus eight. The total capacitance is going to be equal to two microfarads times eight microfarads divided by two plus eight, which is 10 microfarads. So two times eight is 16 divided by 10. So I've got 1.6 microfarads. Everybody see that? This is my total amount of charge that I've got there. I'm sorry, total amount of capacitance for the two together. Now here's what I wanna do with this. I wanna find out what the voltage is across each one of these, okay? Now I know that I've got a capacitance total equal to 1.6 microfarads. Well, 
imagining this as one capacitor and I've got 10 volts here. 10 volts, remember Q is equal to C times V. So how much Q do I have? Well, I've got 1.6 microfarads and that's multiplied by uh, 10 volts. Okay, so that would be 16 micro what? Micro coulombs, right? This would be volts, okay. So 1.6 microfarads times 10 uh, volts would give me 16 micro coulombs. Now, here's a good question. What is the charge on C1 right here? Well, it's 16 micro coulombs because to charge this whole thing up, that much had to go into the top of the first capacitor and the same amount of charge comes out the bottom and goes into the top of the second. And that's the same amount of charge that comes out of the bottom of the second one and back around to the battery. So both of these have the same amount of charge. So this is 16 microcoulombs and this one is 16 microcoulombs. Okay, everybody with me there? Now, to find voltage, how do we do that? Well, look at this equation right here. Voltage would be equal to Q divided by C. So for the first one, what would I have? Up here, Q would be um, two, and that would be two divided by 16, right? No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I got that backward. 16 is Q, and I've got two microfarads. So dividing 16 by two would be eight, right? So that would be, over here I've got eight volts. And I'm gonna put a circle around that so it doesn't kind of blend into everything else. And then down here, I've got 16 for Q divided by eight. So that would be two volts. Look at that. So the bigger the capacitor, the smaller the voltage. Smaller the capacitor, the bigger the voltage. Now, these can change, as I said, because capacitors here in the real world do have parallel resistances and there's gonna start up a voltage divider network, but it's gonna to have to discharge one capacitor and charge the other one. So these voltages are subject to change unless these are perfect capacitors. But this is the way that you would calculate that type of thing, okay? All right, look at that getting somewhere. All right. All right. Um, tell you what. I think what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and make a little longer video. I, we're, we're really a little ahead uh, from the amount of stuff that I've been giving you. So I think I'll go ahead and go into the, uh, the next area and then start talking about that. And then we're gonna come back to capacitors and so forth and do some stuff with them. But uh, I'm just gonna continue on with this lecture. Like I say, I don't really need to give you two and a half hours this week because I gave you quite a lot last week and I'm trying to sort of pace myself. I'm sure y'all don't mind that. Anyway, I'm having a ball up here. It's fun to talk about this stuff. I enjoy it. I really enjoy it doing stuff with it, where you make things work. All right, you get the picture. All right, let's go down here and uh, do another screen share. Okay, now this is something called an inductor. And the symbol for an inductor is a little squiggly, circly line. And uh, this really represents a coil, if you will. Like if I were to take this pencil and I wrap a wire around the pencil and it can be wrapped tight or it can be stretched out, either one, as long as the turns of wire don't touch the other turns, that, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. But anyway, this will allow current to circulate around in a loop. Now, whenever you have current moving through a wire, you actually have a magnetic field set up. And I got news for you. A magnetic field possesses energy. It possesses potential energy, just like an electric field possesses energy. 
so with an inductor, uh, an inductor is essentially a coil of wire that we're allowing the current to flow through. And because of the nature of the turns, this is actually called a solenoid, you wind up generating a magnetic field. Let me show you kind of what that looks like. I didn't do this, but let me show you this. If you have a loop of wire, like so, you send a current in here, we're talking conventional current. Okay, you use the right hand rule. You put your thumb, now I know my thumb is a little bigger than the diagram here, but you put your thumb in the direction of the current flow and your fingers represent the flux. So essentially you got flux going in here and coming out here, going into the board here and coming out here, going in here and coming out here, all the way around. So what you wind up with is flux is coming out of this coil, just like that. And it's going into the surrounding area this way. Okay. And you see that the direction of the flux inside of this uh, loop, the singular loop, is, um, is coming at you. Okay. It's, it's coming at you with the right hand rule. Okay, now what happens if we took that and we did this? We make a whole bunch of loops, like so. <laughs> well, you're taking one loop and then doing another and then doing another. And what you wind up doing is you're creating a magnetic field that circulates around this solenoid or coil to look like this. Now it extends all the way out into space, but we're just gonna draw a little bit of it. So the field is down through here, it kind of ripples around in these coils comes out the end and then circulates back around. These lines are all connected. These are magnetic lines of flux. It's a magnetic field. And this magnetic field here is present anytime there is a current in this coil. So you've got a current, you've got a magnetic field. Okay, now that stores electrical energy. And when you look at this, uh, you've got this symbol right here. And the property, the ability to store energy in that is related to the inductance, the inductance, and it's going to be in units of Henry's, named after a scientist. And the symbol that we use for inductance is L, capital L. Now, if you go back to this right here, uh, and I don't want to get too deep in this, this is just like general physics, but if you were to put an iron bar in here, something that's ferromagnetic, iron, steel, whatever. You put it in here so you no longer have inside of this thing, you no longer have a uh, basically air or a vacuum, then you have increased what's called the permeability of the space in here. Now, we've been looking at epsilon naught as the permittivity of free space for capacitors. This would be uh, mu naught, and mu naught is the permeability. Permittivity and permeability. This would be the permeability of free space. Now, if you put something in here, the total permeability, let's say mu of the material itself, would be um, equal to it could be equal to 120 times mu naught. So this is, or you could call this the relative permeability, put an ER there, but it could be like 120 times larger than the uh, permeability of uh, free space. So if you have a certain amount of inductance and you put a piece of iron in here, especially if you looped it all the way around like a, a kind of like a donut here and a donut over there, you'd wind up having a lot more inductance out of this thing, okay? Now, uh, there's a lot to say about this, and I don't want to get into the physics of it too much, but uh, what I'm going to show you is if you have iron and, let's say, an enhanced permeability, then you would show it this way. If it's, um, if it's a powdered iron core, and there's a reason for that, you might have something like that. If the iron core cannot have any currents in it, but we'll get to that maybe later. All right, so these are all symbols for the in inductor. You can also have uh, 
you can also have this. You can have an arrow through here, which means it's a variable inductor. Now, um, Faraday's law. Let me show you that first. Faraday's law says that there is a voltage, let's say E sub L, okay? And this E sub L is equal to the number of turns of wire that's wrapped around, let's say a toroidal core. Let me, uh, let me draw you a, a core. This makes me think of policemen. You know, they like donuts. Okay. Anyway, it's a donut. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a coil. We're going to take our coil and we're going to wrap it around here, just like this. All right. And if we put a current in here, what we're going to get is we're going to get a, we're going to get a circulating magnetic field, depending on which way the current's flowing, this is going to be one way or the other. And it'll circulate all around this toroid. Now this has to be something like iron or steel. Normally it's not steel. There's a reason for that. But normally this would be like iron or powdered iron or whatever the case may be. Okay, so this thing is going to actually have an inductance. But what I want to show you is this. This is the number of turns that you have here. Number of turns. And this is the rate of change. Uh, this would be di over well, let me, let me back up. I'm getting to something else here. This would be D phi. Got to step ahead. D phi DT. Now you say, well, what is phi? Well, phi is actually the magnetic flux. Okay. This is the number of Weber's of flux that's circulating in this. So in other words, if I have magnetism in the form of circulating flux inside of this toroidal inductor. And the amount of flux in Weber's is changing with respect to time, I will get a voltage here. I will get a voltage. Correspondingly, if I put a voltage on this across here, and I got n number of turns, I will get a changing flux with respect to time. So in other words, if I have a changing amount of magnetic flux through here, which is d phi dt, I will get a voltage induced across this. So if, if I've just got a flux here, and I don't even have a source over here, and this flux is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, or getting larger and larger and larger, maybe we're driving with another coil over here, I'm going to get a voltage across the coil that I've got here, okay? Now, carrying this on, and I'm skipping some steps, but you actually wind up uh, with this equation right here. Rather than E, we call this V of T. This is L, which is the inductance in Henry's, and this is DI dt. Now, we've gone from number of turns, et cetera, to straight over here to inductance. But this is sort of a manifestation, kind of an indirect manifestation of Faraday's law. And here we've got L, which could easily be in the micro or milla or Henry range, or it goes up to hundreds of Henry's and even bigger in some cases. And this is the rate of change in amps per second. So this is the derivative of the current with respect to time. We're assuming that it is changing. So whenever there is a change of current, there is a voltage induced in our coil, okay? Whenever there is a voltage applied to a coil, you can divide it by the inductance and that will give you the rate of change of current with respect to time in amperes per second. Okay, so this is the relationship between current and voltage in an inductor. Now, if you wanna see what the current is as a function of time, we can basically look at this, this is one, 1 over L is equal to the integral where you integrate voltage with respect to time dt. So this is going to be the voltage, basically voltage times time, and divided by L is going to be the number of amps that you have here. But the integral works out a little bit better. We can start at T1 and go to T2 with a definite integral. Now, let me show you this. 
Um, suppose that we have a voltage. Now this is the input here. I'm gonna take this, this coil here and I'm gonna put a voltage on it. Right now it doesn't have a voltage. So I'm gonna put a battery and I'm gonna put a few volts here. Now when I put a few volts, this is what's gonna happen at that same time here, because I've got a voltage and we're integrating with respect to a, a changing time T2, this is gonna build and build and build and build. The current's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until we get to this point right here. And then what's gonna happen is, uh, uh, da, 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 da. I did not do this right. I'm sorry. Somehow I messed up. All right. Okay, so as long as I've got a fixed voltage here, I'm going to increase and increase and increase my current. When I get to this point here, my voltage will have dropped to zero. Sorry for that mistake. So anyway, that would be, this would drop to zero and then it's flat. So from here all the way over to here, it's not quite lined up, but anyway, from here to here, I've still got a current flow in here, but I have no voltage. And that's the way it would, would actually work. And, um, then what happens is um, if I put a negative voltage, and I don't know what I was doing here, I really don't. Okay. So this is level over to essentially here. And then if I put a negative voltage and that negative voltage is bigger than that, this thing is gonna go kind of like that. It's gonna be a steeper decline. So the current is gonna build as long as you put a voltage on it. If you put a constant voltage, that current will build and build and build and build. I'll give you an example. If you look at the basic equation here that I just showed you, E sub L or V sub L, you could use either one, is equal to L DI DT. Well, if you take divide to both sides, you've got the voltage across the inductor divided by the inductance is simply equal to rate of change of current with respect to time, okay? So if I had, uh, I'll just say that I've got a voltage of 10 volts here and I've got, oh, let's say 10 Henry's, just make life simple. 10 volts divided by 10 Henry's would be one. So I would have over here one amp per second. So my current would be changing at one amp per second. It would be continuously changing. So if we graph this thing out, what you would have I don't know why I made that mistake earlier. You would have a straight line. That would be a straight line, okay? And if this is one second, this would be one amp. At two seconds, you'd have two amps, like so. So it would just be a straight linear increase. There's no bending to that curve. Well, how far does it go? Well, in theory, it just keeps going. This is always limits to things, okay? All right, all right. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. And uh, I think it's funny. My father was a politician. He was quite the character. And uh, we have a lot in common. We have a lot that's not in common. He died in 83. But... Uh, my father was at Christmas. I, I was too young to remember. That was one or two years old. But somebody bought him a book, okay? And in this book, you know, it had a cover. You know, you could open it up. And the title of the book was The Illustrated History of the Nudist Colony in North America or something to that effect. My mother couldn't tell the story without laughing. And... Anyway, he takes this book out and it's probably got a couple of kind of suggestive pictures on the front cover. And he took the book and just to be funny, he was going to kind of take a peek at it like this. And he kind of got his eye real close to it and he had his finger on the little metal cover that went around the book. And he gradually opened it up. He screamed. The book flew across the room, landed on the other side of the room. And everybody got a huge laugh out of my father. And he was not a man that appreciated people laughing at him. Of course, I'm sure he went along with it. What happened to dad? Well, I'll tell you what happened. He got shocked. 
This was a very shocking event for everyone, <laughs> especially him. That book, I didn't see it. I don't remember it. I think I was there, but I don't remember it. But that book, I can tell you what, what the book had in it. It probably had a 1.5 volt battery. You think, a oh, 1.5 volt battery is not going to shock anybody. You are correct. You're not even going to feel it unless you take two wires and put it across two fillings in your teeth. But essentially, let me show you what happened. And this has to do with inductors. All right. Um, you had you had a battery. Okay, not a big battery, just a little like 1.5 volt flashlight batteries. And back in those days, they barely had flashlight batteries. They barely been invented. And uh, anyway, uh, you have an inductor over here. Probably had a little iron core to it to give it some extra inductance. And uh, essentially, you had this deal where there was a switch and the switch was off, something like that. And let's suppose that this happened to be, now this is not a capacitor that I'm drawing here, but this is the covers of the book. Okay, so one cover of the book, the other cover of the book. Had a coil across it. And as you open these covers, the switch actually makes a transit down here. And it, first of all, it connects with the circuit and puts 1.5 volts across this inductor. Now, the current's going to build in the inductor. It's not going to be a lot because the battery can't deliver a lot of current, but, uh, you know, a number of milliamps. So anyway, when this switch comes across this terminal and it doesn't stay on this terminal, as you open the book, it just makes contact. And then as you open the book a little farther, it breaks contact. Well, while it's making contact here, the inductor gets energized. So the inductor has 1.5 volts. And I don't know how many milliamps, let's just say, uh, um, let's say 100 mils, 100 milliamps, flowing through the inductor just as that switch makes contact. But then it continues on to this position over here where it's an open circuit. So what do you have? Well, you've got, um, you've got some energy stored in the inductor. I haven't talked to you about energy and inductor. I have it on that other page, but that would be U sub L. And look at this, what an interesting equation. One half times the inductance in Henry's times the current squared. We see this over and over and over. So the energy in joules is equal to one half Li squared. And inductors, you can get a pretty good size inductor unlike a capacitor in a fairly small area. So anyway, he energizes this thing with 100 milliamps. And then all of a sudden, this thing is spring loaded up here. So as he opens the book a little bit more and opens it some more and opens this more, it just goes snap. And it snaps away from this terminal really quick. It doesn't have any time hardly that it's in contact once it begins to move and it snaps open which makes this an open circuit. It takes the battery completely out of the circuit at that point. Now, while it's in contact, let's look at this. While it's in contact, uh, you basically have an amount of current, which is equal to 100 milliamps. That's a uh, 0.1 amps. And over when it opens up, that current goes to zero milliamps in a tiny fraction of a, just a fraction of a, of a millisecond. Now, when this occurs, look at this. The voltage across the inductor, and I'll use a V this time, you can use E or V, it doesn't matter. Then this is gonna be L times DI DV, or excuse me, DT. So, if you're going from 100 milliamps to zero milliamps in almost zero time, let's just say, for example, you got a you know moderate size inductor in there. Let's say it's a one Henry. So that's one, okay? And let's say that the 100 goes to zero. That's a change of 0.1 amps in uh, 0 0.0001 seconds. 
I mean, it's going to be really fast. Okay. Okay. So uh, what would that be? That would be, uh, let me, let me do the math on it here. So that would be 0.1 divided by 0 0.0001. That's a thousand. So this is a thousand. So this value right here is a thousand amps per second. Okay. Thousand amps. I really need to do that. I was thinking that was a five when I looked at it, but anyway, thousand amps per second and times one. Dad got a thousand volts out of that. If these parameters were right, he sure acted like it. Anyway, what happens is here's one finger here. Here's the other finger here. It goes through the body, not a thousand volts, but what happens is it, it has enough voltage to push enough current through the human body to be extremely unpleasant. And that's what happened. They used to make stuff like this all the time. They, they don't do this anymore. Um, too much liability involved. Somebody could have a heart attack and then they'd be sued for everything they uh, ever earned. Uh, my father was a big prankster though. He liked to pull practical jokes. He pulled some really bad ones on some of his colleagues. But uh, this one was on him. I do also remember he used to be, uh, he used to enjoy getting um, what they call loud loads, which were little, it's like dynamite in something a little like a miniature toothpick. And you stick that in a cigarette or a cigar, deep as you can get it, and they smoke for a while. And then when it burns down to that, the whole cigar or cigarette just explodes on the end. He didn't know it, but one night I decided to, uh, load up one of his cigars and I was asleep on the sofa when it blew up. Anyway, I didn't get in trouble. It was kind of funny. Okay. So anyway, this is, this is what you get here. What if you had something like, uh, what if you had like a hundred Henry's and you had a thousand amps, not a hundred milliamps, but a thousand amps. What happens when, when you have current flowing here? Let me show you, let me show you this. Um, let's suppose that, um, uh, let's suppose I have a battery and I have a resistor. Okay. And over here, I've got an inductor. Okay. And this battery supplies a current through the resistor. And what's going to happen here is this current's going to build and build and build and build in the inductor. And there's no law that says that you know, theoretical or otherwise, that I can't come in here and put a wire directly across here after there's a current in this inductor. Okay. And let's just say I've got 10 Henry's and a thousand amps. Okay. Okay. That's a lot of current by the way, but anyway, I've got 10 Henry's and a thousand amps. And right now, when I do this, I can remove, I can actually remove all of this stuff. I don't need it. Get rid of it. Does my current go to zero? No, it doesn't. As long as there's no resistance in the wire around here, or there's no resistance, or I should say, and there's no resistance in the inductor itself, this current just keeps circulating. How much current do we have? Well, how much did we put in there initially? We had a thousand amps. Okay. How long will that circulate? Uh, theoretically, forever. It'll never quit. Do we use this? Actually, we do. Um, at LSU Shreveport, a number of years back, uh, there was a young, uh, let's see, he was, he was a uh, physical chemist. Okay. He was a physical chemist, and they gave him the job of taking care of the NMR nuclear magnetic resonance machine that they use for looking at organic molecules. And his job was to make sure that the machine had plenty of liquid helium in it. Now, liquid helium is somewhere down, I'm not sure, it's two to four Kelvin. It's way down there, close to, close to absolute zero. And in uh, any event, um, when you get copper to that temperature, it becomes a superconductor. And when it gets to be a superconductor, there is no resistance. Let me say this again, 
no resistance. The resistance of the wiring and, and so forth in the inductor and everything it connects that's at that temperature, as long as it's copper, it gets down to zero ohms. It's a quantum mechanical effect. I don't fully understand it. I wouldn't even try to explain it. But you do get superconductivity at that level. Now, um, an NMR requires a magnet of normally, I think, two to maybe 10 or 15 Teslas. That's a lot of magnet. And you can do it in other ways. But the best way to do it is to actually create a superconductive magnet. And that's exactly what we would have here if this whole thing were in a vat of liquid helium. Then they put it in a bigger vat, and that bigger vat is insulated thermally from the container that contains the liquid helium. And in the bigger vat around it, they put liquid nitrogen. Now, the reason for that is liquid nitrogen is way cheaper than liquid helium. So it shields this inner core of colder material it, it shields it better from the outside room temperature because you got boiling liquid nitrogen out there. Well, anyway, his job was to make sure that this thing is fed, not only liquid helium here to keep this inductive path and the magnet that's formed by that inductor, keep it energized, but he also had to put the um, liquid nitrogen around to make sure that the liquid helium didn't boil away. Well, his name was Rob Wilson, and Rob moved on. He got him another job at another university. And when he left, uh, let's, I'm not going to name names, but one person said, so-and-so is responsible for the NMR. And that person said, no, so-and-so is responsible. And that person said, no, so-and-so is responsible. And that person said, no, I think it's so-and-so. The bottom line was there was no chain of responsibility whatsoever. And... After a period of time, uh, the liquid nitrogen boiled away, then the liquid helium boiled away, and it exposed a tiny amount of that coil. And I think the current in those coils, and I'm just pulling this figure as a fairly reliable figure, I think it's around 10,000 amps. There was many joules of energy stored in this coil that made the magnetic field for the NMR. It was like a big permanent magnet. It did not vary. That current was constant. How long would it last? Indefinitely. But when you exposed a little bit of that material to temperatures above the level for superconductivity, you get a little bit of resistance. The resistance develops a power. That power heats up that portion of the coil. You get a runaway effect. And within a fraction of a second, every bit of that energy is converted into heat in the midst of whatever liquid uh, helium is left in the system. They said the whole room shook when that thing went off. It was spewing uh, gases out. You know, you could, I mean, it looked like a monster. And said it was shaking the whole room. After which, there's no energy left in the coil. So they had to actually pay, I think it was $20,000 to have a team come out replenish it with helium and, and nitrogen and re-energize this coil. And then the re-energizing process, they had to close the circuit, just like I did here with a wire, basically close it and allow this thing to continue its field. It's been that way for many years. It's still got the same energy that they put in it that day. Not the original energy that was lost after Dr. Wilson left. But anyway, let me show you this. What would happen? What would happen if suddenly I break this wire? I say, I'm going to break this wire right here. Right here. Let's say it's a switch and we just open the switch. Well, how much voltage will be produced here? Well, the answer to that is how fast can you open the switch? Look at this. Here is, I'll use E this time, E sub L, the voltage across this inductor would be equal to the inductance. And we said just 10 Henry's multiplied by the rate of change of rate of change of the current. So the current starts off at 100 amperes. Where is it in? Zero. So how much change do you have? A negative 100 amps. 
And say we did this in a millisecond, 0 0.001 second. 0 0.001 divided into a thousand is a million times 10 is 10 million volts. So this would be 10, 10 million volts across this. If you can open it 10 times faster, you will have a hundred million volts across the inductor. So what's happening is you said, well, well, what actually happens when you open a switch? When you do, there will be a dramatic electrical arc between these two contacts because this cannot shut down immediately. And the inductor will furnish as much voltage as is necessary to push the current through. It's only going to slow down gradually. Now, mind you this, if you look at the voltage across this arc, there may be thousands of volts here. So with thousands of volts and a certain amount of inductance, you're going to have a certain rate that this current actually decreases at. It's not going to be just instant. So that will dictate, in other words, the voltage that's across the arc divided by the inductance would give you the actual number of amps per second that this is going to change. They have a lot of problems with this in the industry where you have a lot of current flowing and all of a sudden you try to break that circuit. You got to have an arc interrupter to do that. I mean, you get an arc 10 feet long in some of these uh, systems. Um, generally not caused by inductance, but sometimes just breaking a super high tension circuit you create plasma and the farther you pull the two contacts apart, the bigger the arc gets. That's not necessarily an inductive thing, but you do have trouble quench, uh, quenching arcs at times. So anyway, you can get a very, very large amount of voltage by a little bit of voltage, just energizing this to a certain amount of uh, current and then suddenly opening up that circuit. I'm going to throw this out to you. I like to give you some extraneous information, as you probably figured out by now. Um, in electronics, and I've used one one time, but I know how they work. It's called a buck boost converter. And they're doing amazing things with uh, transistors now. These are those MOS, metal oxide semiconductor FETs, field effect transistors. What they do is this is a little bitty component. You can buy one for maybe a dollar or two. It's not, they're not terribly expensive maybe three or four dollars. And you apply a small inductor to it and some capacitors and you attach it to a voltage. Here's what happens. This thing has its own sort of low scale logic in it. And these transistors operate like switches opening and closing. So you'll close a switch for a period of time and take a relatively low voltage, maybe a volt or two or three, and you will apply it to an inductor. And when the current in that inductor reaches some final value, that switch opens that's charging the inductor. And then the inductor says, I'm going to keep flowing that current regardless. So it brings the voltage way up to keep its current flowing. That's what it does. It has electrical inertia. And as that inductor with that extension of Faraday's law, when it generates a tremendous amount of voltage, it's usually not tremendous, but it's, it's a higher voltage. As that field is breaking down, that voltage goes over through a diode and then into a capacitor for storage, and you wind up with a much higher output voltage than you had on the input. And you do it with an inductor and an integrated circuit and a capacitor. Or two. It's called a buck boost converter. Uh, they use this in a lot of solar applications where you have solar panels. And you'll take the current from the solar panel and you'll energize an inductor with it. And then suddenly you just open the inductor. Now you're not allowing this to go to a thousand volts. Okay. Because that would damage something. But what happens is when it opens, it's that current is coming through the inductor is forced around through another circuit where it's actually filling up a capacitor to a voltage that's higher than what you put into the circuit. If you say, well, doesn't that break conservation of energy? You're increasing your voltage? No, because the current is decreasing. You're not getting a free ride here. You're not getting something from nothing. But what you are getting is you're getting a higher voltage at, at uh, lower current from a lower voltage at higher current. It's kind of like a transform. 
these things are cheap. They're very easy to use and you can power a, you know, a fair, cir fair size circuit with it. I don't use them much because I don't need that. Most everything I've got has got plenty of supply that's attached to it. But these are things that you can do with an inductor. Okay. Now, uh, let me go back to my drawing. I hope y'all are not watching all this at one time. Uh, that could be really boring. Okay, let's do another screen here. Okay, now, what about inductors in series and inductors in parallel? Well, if, if you've got two inductors and uh, you put them in parallel, then essentially um, you're, you're lowering your inductance, okay? So if you put them in parallel, you're gonna to have to use this formula. This is the same thing for resistors in parallel, okay? So inductance is diminished here, or you could say L1 times L2 divided by L1 plus L2. What if you put them in series? That's easy because think about it this way. If I've got an air core inductor that has a hundred turns, it's got a certain inductance L1. If I put another hundred turns on it, that's like adding another L1, that would be L2 in this case. So now I've got L1 and L2, it's just like having a bigger coil. The bigger the coil, the longer that coil, the more inductance you have. So it makes sense uh, that the total inductance is L1 plus L2. In any combination of series, parallel, series, parallel, parallel, series, you just follow the same basic rules as you would for <clears throat> resistance. This works with resistance. The, the odd duck out is really capacitors. They, they behave uh, quite a bit differently here. But anyway, this is the basic rule that you have for that, for inductors. Okay. Now, there's a lot to know about this stuff. Probably figured it out. <clears throat> I'm about lectured out. But I thought I'd do this before that shot kicks in today. It makes me sick. I don't think it's going to. But uh, first one, felt like I had the flu. I'll tell you, I, I feel very, very blessed that I have had two shots. You don't know. I still can't get out in public because I'm able to bring COVID perhaps back. Even if I don't get sick with it, I, they say that you can bring it back. The doctors say you can get sick and, or not get sick, but actually carry it back to another family member. And my wife has not had her shots. So she's still liking and uh, her sister just barely lived over it. So anyway, I don't want to do that right now, but I'm getting there. Who knows? You might have ever even get to see me one of these days, live and in person. All right, well, that's what I'm gonna do. And uh, by the way, if you will, let me know if you need some help and maybe we'll have another help session on Thursday night. Uh, I don't know if that helped a lot of y'all. Uh, most of the time I was able to answer the questions ahead of time with a little video, but uh, maybe I'll do it that way. And if I don't do it that way, maybe we can meet on Thursday night if you want to. So anyway, that's the way it works. So let me know if you want to meet or need some help with problems. If you don't, then we won't do the thing on Thursday night. We'll just uh, see how much we got left and then uh, do maybe do a lecture on Thursday. I don't want to go too far over um, two and a half hours a week or too far under it. I won't give you your money's worth. All right. Well, I can't think of anything else. So y'all be safe and I'll probably see you on uh, Thursday.